Church, why is this section so, so full? Why, why is that? Uh, just wondering. <laughs> was... From 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Probably, probably the greatest chapter on giving in the whole Bible. You know how full of love and kindness our Lord Jesus Christ was. Though he was very rich, he was in heaven. Yet for your sakes, he became poor, so that by his poverty, he could make you rich. Amen. Lord, we need to stop and consider sometimes all that you've given up all that you've gone through because you love us, to save us, to bless us, to make us your own, to pour out promises, to give us an eternity with you and with each other. You've done so much, you've made us so rich, and we're grateful people, and that's why we give today. We give our tithes and our offerings. Please help us to be faithful in the way that we use them. In the name of Jesus. And the believers said, Amen. 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 <laughs> Becky and I are both from pretty large families. She's one of six. I'm one of six. Some years ago, and between her family and mine, we had three marriages that were in trouble. We had three marriages that were tempted to give up, split up, divorce. And I, as I was thinking about the scripture and the message that I was preparing for, I was, you know, I was thinking of the different troubles in life that I've gone through, that others have gone through. And, and uh, at that particular time, three marriages in our families in trouble. In fact, they were in such deep trouble um, some were giving up on them already. Tempted to give up. Now you've had your troubles too, haven't you? And in fact, haven't you had your times when you have been tempted to give up also? You just, you just thought, I'm just going to be a loser in this area or in this problem. The enemy's got me or he's got us. So I might as well just move on. Tempted to give up. Well, here's what Jesus said in Luke 18. Here's what he wants to say to you and to me today. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that you should always pray and, would you say these next three words with me? Never give up. Always pray and never give up. Lord, I need to hear that. I need to hear this. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we are tempted so many times to give up. In fact, I think some of us have given up on some people, on some troubles, on some things. Lord, Danette, you tell us to never give up, to never give up. So we need our faith built up today, Lord. So feed us with your word. Get into our hearts, our minds, what we need to hear. Encourage us today. And please anoint this teacher in the name of Jesus. And God's church said, Amen. Amen. 
in this parable, just from the first verse. Let's look at the first verse one more time. One day Jesus told his disciples a parable to show that they should always pray and never give up. Just in that verse right there, Jesus is supposing that God's people pray. We do pray, don't we? Amen. Prayer is a privilege for us, isn't it, church? Think about it a moment. In the name of Jesus, God the Father says, Come on into my study anytime. God who created the whole universe. God who made you. The same God who's in charge of everything. In charge of all history. The same God who can do whatever he wants. And you and I compared to him are... Hmm, and yet he says, come and talk to me, doesn't he? So prayer is truly a privilege, isn't it, church? But prayer is also a duty. He has saved you. He saved me. He set us aside for his own purposes. He wants to use us as individuals and as the greater church to accomplish things in this church or in this world. There's a lot to do in this world, isn't there? And since we belong to him, he bought us with the blood of his son. He has things for us to do. And part of that is prayer. We are called to pray. So prayer is not just a privilege. It is also a duty. Amen. Prayer is also a constant work. Work. Constant. <laughs> uh, do you have any needs in your life? Do you see any needs in the people around you? Anyone need God in the community or in your family? So, prayer is something we need to do continuously because of the needs, so many needs around us. Every day, we need to pray. And have you ever noticed that? Or let me ask if this is true in your case. That we never weary in prayer. We never reach the place where we say, I'm not going to pray anymore. This is too much of a burden. Just somehow God has given us such grace that we never tire of prayer. We want to pray. We want to talk to him more and more again and again. Am I describing you there? Say amen if I am. Amen. And when we pray, you know, we can get very specific in our prayers. God wants us specific. But just generally, what we're doing when we pray is we're asking for strength and for wisdom so that we can battle our spiritual enemies. Now, I want you to hold on to that. I want you to keep that in your mind so that you can have that over top of the other things that the Lord's going to show us here today. When we pray, we are praying for strength and wisdom against spiritual enemies. Remember, we battle not against flesh and blood. Isn't that right? But it's the spiritual powers, wickedness in high places, the devil and demons working against and through people. We're praying for strength and wisdom to battle those spiritual enemies and to get victory in our troubles for ourselves. But we're also praying for strength and wisdom against the spiritual enemies of our brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
you do pray for your pastor once in a while, right? You do know life isn't just duck soup for me, right? That I do have some troubles, I do have some things, I do have some enemies. But when we also pray for the spiritual enemies of our blood families, don't we? You pray for your blood family. Oh, amen, you must, you've got to. Because they have enemies against them, don't they? And you also, you and I are also to pray for the spiritual enemies of the lost people around us. They're lost. Most of them don't even know they have spiritual enemies. That is our responsibility, our duty to be in prayer, in battle for the lost souls, the lost people that you and I know that God has placed around us. <clears throat> now when God pours out his help, he answers those prayers. We call that grace. We don't deserve any help from him, but he promises to help and he does. He gives us grace. He pours out grace in answer to our prayers. Now in this parable, the purpose of this parable is to in, encourage us to be persistent in our prayers. In most of the parables, Jesus doesn't, doesn't tell the purpose or the application of the parable until the end of the parable. But this one's unusual in that right up front, he tells us what he wants us to learn from this one. And the, and the lesson is this. Be persistent in your prayers. Right up front. Let's go to verse 2. Luke 18, 2. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. Now I want you to look for the word justice to show up in some of the other scriptures too. And, uh, and notice it when it shows up again. What's she looking for? She said to the judge, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, no one in particular, just himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Hmm. The power of perseverance. It's what Jesus wants us to see, to notice, to realize. There is power in perseverance. Even though this widow uh, only had this one thing working for her. Perseverance. Now, she probably didn't know the judge, did she? She probably was not a person of power in the community, not the way Jesus is telling the parable. She probably didn't have a lot of money to help back her up when she came to see the judge. She didn't even have a husband to support her when she came to the judge and tried to get the judge to, to do something about this person giving her a rough time. The only thing she had working for her to influence this judge was perseverance. Hmm. The judge didn't care what God thought. Didn't, maybe the judge knew or didn't know what God had to say about things, what was right and what was wrong. Didn't matter, this judge didn't care. This judge didn't care what other people thought. Reading about the cases in the newspaper. So what? So apparently this judge was at the place in life where I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's how it's going to be. I don't care about anyone else. 
In other words, he didn't care about this widow at all or helping this widow out at all. In fact, my guess is he was probably holding off because at that time there were some uh, judges who were not who they should have been. He was probably waiting on a little money bribe that might motivate him to do something on this widow's behalf. The thing he did realize was that she wasn't going to give up. She is one who would persevere. And for that reason and that reason only, he gave in. It's like um, the child that wears down the parent with the requests. Mom, I just got to have that that pair of jeans. Everyone else wears those nowadays. Honey, you've got plenty of jeans. You don't need any. Ah, oh, but Dad, Dad said I could have some. And, and nothing like a teenager to keep coming at you, right? And they can wear a parent down. And if they don't get the parent, they'll go to the grandparents. And they'll work on the grandparents. Wow. They persevere. And oftentimes that perseverance you know, wins out, doesn't it? Uh, we've just had uh, two grandkids with us here for about a month. They just went home Wednesday. And there's this two-year-old running around our house. And when he wanted something, you know, he didn't give up with a simple no. Yeah, he would continue to ask for whatever he wanted, whether it was uh, cookies. We called him the cookie monster for a while. And on Christmas Day, it seemed every time we turned around, he had another cookie in his hand. Uh, but he was the kind who would persevere. Uh, now, we did set some limits where we kept saying no, and he just had to line up. But then he had this little brother, see, named Hayden. And Hayden's only three, four months old. And when Hayden wasn't wanted something, <clears throat> he wouldn't quit. In fact, now he didn't do this much, but he did this sometimes. Three, four months old, he got hungry and he would cry. And you think uh, when his mom said it's not time to eat yet, that that, that satisfied him? Uh, not at all. He just cried harder. And in fact, he got to crying so loudly and screaming at the top of his lungs uh, uh, at times where he would run out of breath and quit breathing. He was screaming so loud. He persevered. And you know what? He always got his way. Every time he got his way. He got to eat, maybe not right away, you know, but, he, but, but uh, perseverance. Well, that's what this judge felt like about this widow. She's not going to quit. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, verse 6. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Now, if I was reading this and he hadn't said that, I'd have thought he'd have been saying right here, learn a lesson from the widow. That's not what he said. We're to learn a lesson from the judge. Oh, yeah? What lesson? In other words, Jesus is saying, hear what the judge has to say. And it is this. If this judge, who is unjust and doesn't care about anyone but himself finally gives in because of someone persevering, how much more will God, who does care about his children, finally answer those prayers that we pour out as we persevere in lifting uh, in those needs up to him? How much more will he answer? How much more will he pour out his grace in meeting our request and helping us with our enemies? Now, what's required to receive this grace from God? What's required from us? Well, 
we're going to see one of the things required is that we pray day and night. That'll be in the next verse when we, when we get there. That we're to pray day and night. That's required of us. We, in other words, we're to be persistent in our prayers. We're to pray. No. Now wait a minute. We're to cry out. We're not just to pray with our lips unto God. We're to cry out to God with our hearts. We're to pray with our hearts to God. You know, there's a difference between praying with your lips and then praying with your heart. I hear a lot of prayers with lips. They might go something like this. Sit down to a meal. Um, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, that's a lip prayer, isn't it? Praying with your heart is going to be something a little different. I remember not long ago we were, uh, we were back at uh, Damascus in the Parsonage and, and the weather forecast was strong winds. There's a front coming through. So this, after, this one afternoon the wind started blowing and they blowed harder and they blew harder. And this big old farmhouse we're living in started shaking. You ever have the house shake on you because the winds were blowing so? The house was shaking. I looked out the back picture window in the woods back there. The trees are starting to fall over. Whoom. Tops were being blown out of the trees and you could see the wind just hustling them. You know, right, right through the woods. Uh, some of the evergreen trees were bent so far over I didn't know how they did not break. And I thought... All those trees being knocked down back there and this house shaking like it is, the roof could blow off of this place about any time. And so I started to pray. Now let me tell you, I was not just praying with my lips. I was praying because I was telling God, I says, Lord, you called me to be a preacher. I said, I'm not done yet. I'm not that old yet. I says says, don't let me die in this house being knocked down. <laughs> I was praying with my heart. There's a difference between lip prayers and heart prayers. And God is looking for heart prayers. Now you've been praying some things to God over and over again, haven't you? For some people, about some topic, something in your own life. You've been praying over and over. Maybe some on some areas for years. Isn't that true? And you keep praying. Now, that, now you know that God hadn't forgotten, right? In fact, he, he remembers your first prayer on that topic, doesn't he? He hasn't forgotten. So your further prayers are not just reminding him. God has an excellent memory, let me tell you. So you don't keep praying, you don't persevere because he forgot. That's not, what, that's not what's going on there. And let me tell you this, your continued prayers do not twist God's arm and make him answer your prayer. Okay, I'll answer it. Keep praying like that, I'm going to... Your prayers do not twist God's arm at all. Hmm. What he's looking for, then, is what? He is looking for faithful people. Is that sinking in? He hasn't forgotten. You're not twisting his arm with your further prayers. Why hadn't he answered? Why does he want you to persevere and keep praying about that? Because he's looking for faithful people. Because it's those who are faithful that he has promised to pour out his grace to. Faithful. Full of faith. What he's looking for, church, is faith. And by persevering in prayer, 
praying about that same trouble over and over, asking for help over and over again. You are proving your faith. And that is what Jesus is telling us that God is looking for. He's looking for faith in our persevering prayers. See, Jesus is trying to get across to us right here that we don't really realize the benefit of persistent, faithful prayer. There is a great benefit there. All kinds of benefits. I want to take you to the uh, Old Testament and give you an example of persistent prayer. You, you realize that the Old Testament gives us actual happenings in history and what God did, examples in other words, of the principles that he teaches in the New Testament. So you just can't read the New Testament alone, you have to read the Old Testament and put the two together to really get understanding into, into what God's saying to us. And if you're in your one-year Bible, you've been reading about Jacob the last couple of days. So those of you in your one-year Bibles, are you up to date? Haven't you been reading about Jacob? Who's Jacob? Who's Jacob's dad? Anyone? Jacob's dad is Isaac. And who's Isaac's dad? Abraham. Okay, you're with me. And Jacob, we just read in the one-year Bible, Genesis 32, is going through probably the most important time of his life, the most crucial time of his life. Now, let me build up to what's going on right here. He was born to Isaac, and he had a twin brother named Esau. And... Jacob was the second born. Esau came out first. They named him Jacob because he was holding on to Esau's heel. And the name Jacob means uh, deceiver or one who uses trickery. Because he was holding on to his brother's heel as if trying to get out ahead of him so that he could be the first born and have all those extra blessings. In fact, later in life when they got older... Jacob tricked his brother Esau to hand in the firstborn birthright over to him because he got more in the inheritance if he were the firstborn. In fact, God had spoken to Jacob and made promises that he would use him, give him lots of descendants, bless him. But it seems like every trouble that Jacob had, he tried to use trickery in, in order to get victory over his enemies. Now, late when uh, eventually his brother Esau got very upset with him and, and wanted to kill him, Jacob found out about it and decided he's going to run off up way up north and stay with Uncle Laban for a while. Hope his brother cools down. And while he's up there with uh, Laban, his Uncle Laban, that's where he got his two wives up there and he started growing his family up there. And it seems like every time he got into a battle with someone that he was using trickery to try to win out. For example, Uncle Laban was a trickster pretty much himself and uh, was trying to use Jacob to, uh, to get rich himself. But uh, Jacob would try to, he wanted to use trickery back on Uncle Laban so, so he would uh, uh, keep out the spotted or the striped sheep and, or, and goats or the all black ones in such a way that he was getting more of the, uh, of the flock than his uncle was using trickery. Now God promised to bless him but you see he really wasn't trusting God he was using his own ways in, in order to, to win out over his enemies. Well the day came it was, he needed to go back home back down to the promised land so he took his wives and all his servants and these huge flocks that he had and he knew he had to face his brother Esau, the one who said he was going to kill him, remember. He was not look, Jacob wasn't looking forward to this confrontation. So he got down to Gilead. It's on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And the night before, he heard that 
his brother Esau was coming with 400 men to meet him. Scared the bejeebies out of, his, out of Jacob. And so Jacob made some plans. Here he is again, trying to come against his enemy with his own deceptive plans. He divided up all of, all of his herds and his, and his servants and his family into two groups and he put them across the river. And that night, Jacob's left alone at the camp. And a man showed up. And he wrestled, the Bible says, with this man all night long. And uh, my heading in the Bible says, Jacob wrestles with God. This man was God. And not God the Father, but probably the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ himself. Sometimes called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. So I believe, and many commentators believe, that Jacob's wrestling with Jesus all night long. Now how many of you know Jesus can win a wrestling match with any man? Huh? You all know that? In fact, he proved it by touching Jacob's hip and his hip went out of the socket you know, just in, in their wrestling match. And, but why did Jesus wrestle with Jacob all night long? And why did Jacob not just give up? Uh, the, the Bible tells us that Jacob hung in there because he knew he was wrestling with God. He'd been wrestling with God his whole life. Either trust God or do it my own way and my, my own tricks. Well, he's doing it his own way. And this night, though, he hung in there. He wrestled till morning. And he says, I'm not letting go till you give me a blessing. <clears throat> and he got the blessing from God. And the blessing was this. He received grace from God. And the grace was saving faith. That was the moment that God became Jacob's God. Not just his dad's God and his granddad's God, but he became Jacob's God. God gave him grace to trust God. Instead of trying to handle everything on his own, coming up with his own plans to defeat all of his enemies. And the, and the proof of that was God said, I'm changing your name. You're no longer going to be Jacob. You will be Israel. Do you know what the name Israel means? The name Israel means God fights. Now, it didn't mean that God was going to fight with Jacob his whole life like he did that night. What God was saying to him was, I will fight for you. So the enemies that you have in life, I will fight for you. Yes, you will be in the battle, but I will bring you victory. God fights for you, Jacob. And that's what Israel means. You think the nation of Israel and the people of Israel today realize that? God gave them that name because you know, God's still fighting for the nation and the people of Israel, isn't he? And he's going to continue to do that, just a side note there. So what, what was the big lesson here? Jacob persevered until he got a blessing from God. Till he got an answer from God. He persevered. And that takes us right back to this parable in the New Testament. Um, do you realize, have you realized that the battle itself sometimes, your persevering in prayer and in this battle is good for you? Have you ever thought about that? The battle is good for you. Uh, it got me to thinking about college football teams. Ohio State. Ohio State has a goal every year. They want to win the Big Ten. But Ohio State has a bigger goal now every year. What is it? They want to win the national championship, don't they? And if the person who scheduled the, their, uh, the teams they play against, against just scheduled Mid-American Conference teams, MAC teams, then when it got time for the playoffs at the end of the year, and they have to play somebody like Alabama, 
they may not be ready. So the, so the person who schedules the opponents for Ohio State has to schedule some powerful opponents if they want to be the, win the Big Ten or they want to win the national championship. It gets them ready. It makes them better. In the same way, God uses your battles to make you better and stronger. And that's one reason why he is allowing you to persevere in some of these areas of prayer in your life. Let's go to verse 7. Even he render, rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? All right, church, here's what Jesus is saying to you and I. You're going to have to bear along against some of these enemies. You're just going to have to hang in there. Because it may be some time before you get the answer. Before God pours out his grace. It might be some time. So be patient toward your adversary in the flesh. Be patient with them. In fact, it is required of the followers of Jesus Christ to be patient with their adversaries. And if this widow received mercy and grace from this unjust judge, how much more will we receive mercy and grace? Now I want to interject something right here. Just an assumption that Jesus makes in, in the midst of this parable. And uh, let's turn to 1 John 5, 14. Take a look at this. You, you see, Jesus is assuming that these persistent prayers that we put up, we are asking for God to do the right thing in his answers to our prayers. He's assuming we're asking for him to do... Are you hearing me, church? <laughs> to, that we're asking him to do the right thing. Not something wrong. Not something that's going to hurt somebody else. Not, someone, not something that's going to make me great in other people's eyes. Nope. He's assuming this. We're confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And if he hears, he answers. If we're asking for what pleases him, we'll get grace. We will get an answer eventually. And that's why you read your Bible. You know then what pleases him. You know how to pray. So even though I've been battling a cold, I've been praying, Lord, make me strong enough so I can go and preach. So I can have this um, funeral. Friday we had a funeral. And I'm praying in his will because he called me to do this. You know, so, uh, so he does that. Now, once in a while, he might want me to take a back seat allow somebody else preach. But, but I'm praying the Lord's will when I pray that. And when you pray the Lord's will, you can pray with faith. And he's looking for people who are praying with faith. Amen. Verse 8. He closes up the parable by saying, I tell you, he will grant justice, justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Now, this word quickly here, here uh, does not mean you can't call upon this as a promise from God to answer your prayer right now. What this, it would be better translated, and it is in some other translations, if this word quickly were timely. That he'll answer on time. Not in your time, but in the best time. And the best time is God's time. Somebody say amen. amen. Although we'd like to change his time clock sometimes, wouldn't we? But he will grant justice on time. 
He promises that. Now, when the Son of Man returns, he asks this question, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? He is intimating here that there will be some people whose faith will grow weak and they will get weary of waiting on God to answer their prayer. That's what Jesus is intimating in this statement. But he's making a promise by saying, He will come. In the same way that Jesus will come back a second time, God will come in answer to your prayer. Your persistent, faithful prayers. Prayers of faith. He will come. And the question is, when he does finally come, will he still find faith? The implication is, no, not much. Some just aren't, won't pers persevere. They don't have the faith. Why does he say on earth? He's looking for faith when he comes on earth. That's because when we get to heaven, we're not going to need faith there. <laughs> And for those who go to hell, faith isn't going to do them any good there. So where do you need faith, church? Right here and right now. This reveals that Jesus is looking for faith. He's, in fact, even if there's just a little faith, he will find it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And again, that coming that he's talking about is just not the second coming of God when the judge will make all things right against our enemies. But he's also talking about when Jesus comes now. He is sent here or his angels are sent here to bring the grace of God to give us justice. And that word justice means this. He will deliver us from our enemies and what the enemy's been doing. He will protect us from that enemy taken us and hurting us again, and that he will avenge us for what the enemy did wrong against us, and he will make it right. That's what the good judge does. And he's going to do that in answer to your prayers against the spiritual enemies that you're coming in prayer against. Let me throw a proverb in here. Proverb 24, verse 10, just because it speaks to me, and I'll believe it will to you. If you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. Some of you need to take that one home, don't you? I don't think I need to say any more about that one, do I? <laughs> Persevere. Amen. Which takes greater faith? Prayer with immediate results or praying long and hard before you get results, which takes more faith. Long and hard takes more faith, doesn't it? And what's Jesus looking for? Faith. You know the real reason that people don't pray? is because they have very little faith or no faith. That's why people don't pray. So Jesus is telling us here, persevere. Don't give up on that unsaved loved one. Someone told me the, here not long ago, says, said, my, my husband, I've been praying for him for three decades now, and he's still a heathen. I said, is he dead yet? Said, no. Well, keep praying. Don't give up on that long time sin that you've been battling. Maybe it's been anger. Maybe it's a control thing you have. Or maybe you're one that's been given up too easy. And you're ready to move on. Leave your troubles behind. 
Don't give up. Jesus is saying, persevere. Don't give up on that relationship that's been broken. Keep praying. Hang in there. Come against those spiritual enemies. Don't give up on that health problem. You allow me to say that? Probably most of you in here have some kind of health problem. Don't give up. Hang right in there. Show some faith. Don't give up on that financial problem. Seek God. See what he's got to say. Keep praying. Hang in there. Don't give up on those kids. God hasn't given up, given up on them yet. Don't give up on... Let's move it to another area here. Don't give up, say, on abortion. On our nation turning around where we are right now on abortion. Uh, Y'all know that this Friday is the March for Life in Washington, Washington D.C., right? That's, on the, that's the top of your prayer list, isn't it? The March for Life. Don't we want our nation to turn around on this issue of abortion and life? Amen. Don't give up on our nation there. And pray. In other words, don't give up on Jesus. Hallelujah. Persistent prayer. Listen, church. Persistent prayer proves faith. Will you say that with me? Persistent prayer proves faith. One more time. Persistent prayer proves faith. What's Jesus looking for? Amen. Let's pray. Father, first we need to ask for forgiveness because we have given up so many times and quit praying because our faith has been too small. Forgive us. And we thank you for today, Lord, for giving us grace to build our faith for encouraging us to continue to hang in there, to persevere in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking and helping us today. And all in agreement with that prayer said, Amen. 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 Susie?